The Nation is the oldest continuously published weekly magazine in the United States, covering progressive political and cultural news, opinion, and analysis. It was founded on July 6, 1865, as a successor to William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator. It is published by its namesake owner The Nation Company, LP, at 33 Irving Place, New York City, and associated with The Nation Institute. The Nation has news bureaus in Washington, D.C., London, and South Africa, with departments covering architecture, art, corporations, defense, environment, films, legal affairs, music, peace and disarmament, poetry, and the United Nations. Circulation peaked at 187,000 in 2006 but by 2010 had dropped to 145,000 in print, although digital subscriptions had risen to over 15,000. History the founding and journalistic roots The nation was established in July 1865 at 130 Nassau Street, Newspaper Row, in Manhattan. Its founding publisher was Joseph H. Richards, and the editor was Edwin Lawrence Godkin, an immigrant from Ireland who had formerly worked as a correspondent of the London Daily News and the New York Times. Godkin sought to establish what one sympathetic commentator later characterized as, "...an organ of opinion characterized in its utterance by breadth and deliberation, an organ which should identify itself with causes, and which should give its support to parties primarily as representative of these causes." In its, "...founding prospectus," the magazine wrote that the publication would have, seven main objects", with the first being, "...discussion of the topics of the day, and, above all, of legal, economical, and constitutional questions, with greater accuracy and moderation than are now to be found in the daily press." The nation pledged to, "...not be the organ of any party, sect or body," but rather to, make an earnest effort to bring to discussion of political and social questions a really critical spirit, and to wage war upon the vices of violence, exaggeration and misrepresentation by which so much of the political writing of the day is marred. In the first year of publication, one of the magazine's regular features was The South As It Is, dispatches from a tour of the war-torn region by John Richard Dennett, a recent Harvard graduate and a veteran of the Port Royal experiment. Dennett interviewed Confederate veterans, freed slaves, agents of the Freedmen's Bureau, and ordinary people he met by the side of the road. The articles, since collected as a book, have been praised by The New York Times as "...examples of masterly journalism." Among the causes supported by the publication in its earliest days was civil service reform. Moving the basis of government employment from a political patronage system to a professional bureaucracy based upon meritocracy. The nation also was preoccupied with the re-establishment of a sound national currency in the years after the American Civil War, arguing that a stable currency was necessary to restore the economic stability of the nation. Closely related to this was the publication's advocacy of the elimination of protective tariffs in favor of lower prices of consumer goods associated with a free trade system. Wendell Phillips Garrison, son of William Lloyd Garrison, was literary editor from 1865 to 1906. The magazine would stay at Newspaper Row for 90 years. From a literary supplement in the 1880s to a New Deal booster in the 1930s 
In 1881, newspaperman turned railroad baron Henry Villard acquired the nation and converted it into a weekly literary supplement for his daily newspaper The New York Evening Post. The offices of the magazine were moved to the Evening Post's headquarters at 210 Broadway. The New York Evening Post would later morph into a tabloid, The New York Post, a left-leaning afternoon tabloid, under owner Dorothy Schiff from 1939 to 1976. Since then, it has been a conservative tabloid owned by Rupert Murdoch, while the nation became known for its far left. Ideology. In 1900, Henry Villard's son, Oswald Garrison Villard, inherited the magazine and the Evening Post, and sold off the latter in 1918. Thereafter, he remade the nation into a current affairs publication and gave it an anti classical liberal orientation. Oswald Villard welcomed the New Deal and supported the nationalization of industries, thus reversing the meaning of liberalism as the founders of the nation would have understood the term, from a belief in a smaller and more restricted government to a belief in a larger and less restricted government. Villard sold the magazine in 1935. Maurice Wertheim, the new owner, sold it in 1937 to Frieda Kirchwey, who served as editor from 1933 to 1955. Almost every editor of the nation from Villard's time to the 1970s was looked at for «subversive» activities and ties. When Albert J. Nock, not long afterward, published a column criticizing Samuel Gompers and trade unions for being complicit in the war machine of the First World War, the nation was briefly suspended from the U.S. mail. During the 1930s, the nation showed enthusiastic support for Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal. World War II and Cold War beginnings The magazine's financial problems in early 1940s prompted Kurt Wee to sell her individual ownership of the magazine in 1943, creating a non-profit organization, Nation Associates, formed out of the money generated from a recruiting drive of sponsors. This organization was also responsible for academic responsibilities, including conducting research and organizing conferences, that had been a part of the early history of the magazine. Nation Associates became responsible for the operation and publication of the magazine on a non-profit basis, with Kurt Wee as both president of Nation Associates and editor of the Nation magazine. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Nation repeatedly called on the United States to enter World War II to resist fascism, and after the U.S. entered the war, the publication supported the American war effort. It also supported the use of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. During the late 1940s and again in the early 1950s, a merger was discussed by the nation's Frida Kirchwey, later Carrie McWilliams, and the New Republic's Michael Strait. The two magazines were very similar at that time. Both were left of center, the nation further left than TNR, both had circulations around 100,000, although TNR's was slightly higher, and both lost money—and it was thought that the two magazines could unite and make the most powerful journal of opinion. The new publication would have been called The Nation and New Republic. Kurt Wee was the most hesitant, and both attempts to merge failed. The two magazines would later take very different paths, the nation achieved a higher circulation, and the New Republic moved more to the right. In the 1950s, the nation was attacked as pro communist because of its advocacy of detente with the Soviet Union, and its criticism of McCarthyism. One of the magazine's writers, Louis Fisher, resigned from the magazine afterwards, claiming the nation's foreign coverage was too pro-Soviet. 
Despite this, Diana Trilling pointed out that Kirch Wee did allow anti-Soviet writers, such as herself, to contribute material critical of Russia to the magazine's arts section. During the McCarthyism, the Second Red Scare, the nation was banned from several school libraries in New York City and Newark, and a Bartlesville, Oklahoma librarian, Ruth Brown, was fired from her job in 1950 after a citizens' committee complained she had given shelf space to the nation. In 1955, George C. Kirstein replaced Kirchway as magazine owner. James J. Starrow, Jr. bought the magazine from Kirstein in 1965. During the 1950s, Paul Blanchard, a former associate editor, served as the nation's special correspondent in Uzbekistan. His most famous writing was a series of articles attacking the Roman Catholic Church in America as a dangerous, powerful, and undemocratic institution. Topic from the 1970s through 2019 In June 1979, the nation's publisher Hamilton Fish and then editor Victor Navosky moved the weekly to 72 Fifth Avenue, in Manhattan. In June 1998, the periodical had to move to make way for condominium development. The offices of the nation are now at 33 Irving Place, in Manhattan's Gramercy neighborhood. In 1977, a group organized by Hamilton Fish v. bought the magazine from the Starro family. In 1985, he sold it to Arthur L. Carter, who had made a fortune as a founding partner of Carter, Berland, Potoma and Weil. In 1991, the nation sued the Department of Defense for restricting free speech by limiting Gulf War coverage to press pools. However, the issue was found moot in Nation magazine v. United States Department of Defense, because the war ended before the case was heard. In 1995, Victor Novosky bought the magazine and, in 1996, became publisher. In 1995, Katrina Vanden Heuvel succeeded Novosky as editor of The Nation, and in 2005, as publisher. In 2015, The Nation celebrated its 150th anniversary with a documentary film by Academy Award winning director Barbara Koppel, a 268 page special issue featuring pieces of art and writing from the archives, and new essays by frequent contributors like Eric Foner, Noam Chomsky, E. L. Doctorow, Toni Morrison, Rebecca Solnit, and Vivian Gornick, a book length history of the magazine by D. D. Gutenplan. Plan, which the Times Literary Supplement called an affectionate and celebratory affair, events across the country, and a relaunched website. In a tribute to the nation, published in the anniversary issue, President Barack Obama said, in an era of instant, 140-character news cycles and reflexive towing of the party line, it's incredible to think of the 150-year history of the nation. It's more than a magazine, it's a crucible of ideas forged in the time of emancipation, tempered through depression and war and the civil rights movement, and honed as sharp and relevant as ever in an age of breathtaking technological and economic change. Through it all, the nation has exhibited that great American tradition of expanding our moral imaginations, stoking vigorous dissent, and simply taking the time to think through our country's challenges anew. If I agreed with everything written in any given issue of the magazine, it would only mean that you are not doing your jobs. But whether it is your commitment to a fair shot for working Americans, or equality for all Americans, it is heartening to know that an American institution dedicated to provocative, reasoned debate and reflection in pursuit of those ideals can continue to thrive. On January 14, 2016, the nation endorsed Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders for president. In their reasoning, the editors of the nation professed that Bernie Sanders and his supporters are bending the arc of history toward justice. Theirs is an insurgency, a possibility, and a dream that we proudly endorse. On June 15, 2019, Hovell is scheduled to step down as the editor with D. D. Gutenplan, present editor at large, taking her place. Topic. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Finances. Print ad pages declined by 5% from 2009 to 2010, while digital advertising rose 32.8% from 2009 to 2010. Advertising accounts for 10% of total revenue for the magazine, while circulation totals 60%. The nation has lost money in all but three or four years of operation and is sustained in part by a group of more than 30,000 donors called Nation Associates, who donate funds to the periodical above and beyond their annual subscription fees. This program accounts for 30% of the total revenue for the magazine. An annual cruise also generates $200,000 for the magazine. Since late 2012, the Nation Associates program has been called Nation Builders. Topic: Advertising Policy. In 2004, the Anti-Defamation League criticized the journal for allowing advertisements from the Institute for Historical Review, which promotes Holocaust denial. The nation vowed to not let it happen again. The appearance in the nation of advertisements from the organization Facts and Logic about the Middle East, Flame, was criticized by the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. In response, the nation stated from our point of view, the ad pervades one of the most destructive myths of Israel's right wing, namely, that Palestinians have no legitimate national rights. We run it because the nation's ad policy starts with the presumption that we will accept advertising even if the views expressed are repugnant to those of the editors. Ads that present a political point of view are considered to fall under our editorial commitment to freedom of speech and, perforce, we grant them the same latitude we claim for our own views. But we do reserve the right to denounce the content of such ads. Poetry <inaudible> 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 Since its creation, the nation has published significant works of American poetry, including works by Hart Crane, Elizabeth Bishop, and Adrian Rich, as well as W.S. Merwin, Pablo Neruda, Denise Leverdiv, and Derek Walcott. In 2018, the magazine published a poem entitled, How To by Anders Carlson Wee, which was written in the voice of a homeless man and used black vernacular. This led to criticism from writers such as Roxane Gay because Carlson Wee is white. The nation's two poetry editors, Stephanie Burt and Carmen Jimenez Smith, issued an apology for publishing the poem, the first such action ever taken by the magazine. The apology itself became an object of criticism also. Poet and nation columnist Katha Pollitt, who called the apology, Craven and likened it to a letter written from a re-education camp. Grace Schulman, the nation's poetry editor from 1971 to 2006, wrote that the apology represented a disturbing departure from the magazine's traditionally broad conception of artistic freedom. <laughs> Editors. D. D. Gutenplan replaced publisher Katrina Vanden Heuvel as editor on June 15, 2019. Former editors include Victor Saul Novosky, Carrie McWilliams, and Frida Kirch Wee. <laughs> Regular columns The magazine runs a number of regular columns. Beneath the Radar by Gary Yunge, Deadline Poet by Calvin Trillin, Diary of a Mad Law Professor by Patricia J. Williams, The Liberal Media by Eric Alterman, Subject to Debate 
by Katha Pollitt. Between the Lines by Layla Lalami. The Nation Cryptic Crossword by Joshua Kosman and Henri Pachotto by Frank W. Lewis from 1947 to 2009 regular columns in the past have included Look Out by Naomi Klein Sister Citizen by Melissa Harris Perry Beat the Devil 1984 to 2012 by Alexander Cockburn Dispatches 1984 to 87 by Max Holland and Kai Bird Minority Report, 1982 to 2002 by Christopher Hitchens. Topic. See also Harper and Row v. Nation Enterprises, Nation Magazine v. United States Department of Defense, The American Prospect, The Atlantic, Commentary, Dissent, Jacobin, Mother Jones. The New Republic Reason Washington Monthly National Review Counterpunch